Welcome to my channel, I'm Scott, and in this video, I'm going to walk you through the process of valuing Coinbase's stock by analyzing their financial statements and dissecting their financial ratios so we can determine if it's a buy or a sell. Let's get started with the model. This is a large cap company, 51 billion market cap. They're trading at 204 a share, and they have 250 million shares outstanding. Coinbase offers a brokerage platform to buy and sell cryptocurrency. They also provide companies with the ability to accept crypto as payment for a product or service. Kind of like PayPal, but for crypto. Let's look at their financials. The way you value a company is you estimate the free cash flows into the future and then you discount those numbers back to today's value. That's what we're doing in this video. And free cash flow is cash flow from operations minus capital expenditures. They had a lot of free cash flow in 2021, 4 billion. A big negative in 2022. I'm sure that concerned investors. The stock price plummeted. Back to positive in 2023 up 33% to 1.1 billion in the trailing 12 months. Net income is a profit or loss on the income statements, revenue minus expenses. A similar trend, negative in 2022, but it rebounded 1.5 billion in the trailing 12 months. Really good margins, they convert 31% of their revenue into net income. Revenue is a sales for the company, and that was really high in 2021, 8 billion. It dropped way down to 3.2 billion. It is coming back up to 4.7 billion in the trailing 12 months. A lot of their revenue is fees for the transactions. We'll look at their financials in a little bit to learn more about the company. We estimated four years of future free cash flows. We also estimated the terminal value, which is all cash flows past year four, that's 50 billion. We discounted those numbers back to today using the weighted average cost of capital. We get a value of the company of $44 billion. We divide that by 250 million shares. And we get a calculated stock price of 178. They're trading at 204, so they're trading at a 15% premium. It's a sell according to the model. I have a feeling their stock price is correlated to the price of Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin goes up, so does their stock price. And if Bitcoin goes down, so does their stock price. Kind of like an oil company or a gold company, it moves with the price of the commodity. I think it has less to do with the fundamentals and more to do with the price of crypto. We'll look at that correlation in a little bit and find out. There are 13 companies in the same industry as Coin, and if they have a number in red, they are worse than the median. If they have a number in blue, they're better. They don't spend much in CapEx. Most companies in this industry don't spend much in CapEx. They have a really good debt to equity ratio, 0.5 for every dollar of equity, they have 50 cents of debt. They're only one of the two companies in this industry that does not pay a dividend. And they have the highest market cap of the companies that don't pay a dividend. They generate 1.1 billion of free cash flow, a little worse than the median. S&P generates the most at 4.7 billion. They rank fifth in market cap. 50 billion, a good sized company. They were well over 100 billion at one point. Price to book is about the average. They're trading at six times book value. They're trading at 34 times earnings and 45 times free cash flow. A bit rich, so maybe it's a little overvalued according to these multiples. They're trading at 11 times revenue. They generate a good amount of revenue, 4.7 billion, more than the median average. Less than NASDAQ, and NASDAQ is smaller in terms of market cap. It's funny seeing a publicly traded company called NASDAQ, right? But NASDAQ is a company, it's a publicly traded entity, and they charge other publicly traded entities to trade on their platform. We cannot look at their five-year annual revenue growth rate. They have not been public that long. Coin started trading a little over three years ago. If you put $10,000 into the stock when they started trading, you'd have $6,300 today. Who would have thought? I thought it would be going up, not down, but you would have been way in the red at one point, your 10,000 would have been about 18, 1900. But if you picked it up down here, you could have tripled your money already. Let's go through their second quarter 10Q. Here's their income statement. This is the second quarter of 24, second quarter of 23, first half of 24, first half of 23. Revenue more than doubled, 700 million to 1.4 billion. Big jump. Net revenue, 1.4 billion. Other revenue, 70 million. Let's see if we get a breakdown of this number so we know what it is. Of the 1.4 billion of revenue, 780 million is transaction revenue. These are the fees they take per transaction. Subscription and service revenue, that's recurring revenue, 599 million. Other revenue, 70 million. And their revenue is up 105% from the second quarter of 2023. 
Transaction revenue up 139%, subscription 79%, other 50%. For the first half of 2024, revenue is up even more, 109%. Here's a much more thorough breakdown of the 1.4 billion of revenue. Their net revenue, the 1.4 billion, 781 million is transaction revenue, 599 million subscription revenue. Of the 781 million of transaction revenue, consumers, 665 million, institutions, 63 million, and other transaction revenue, 53 million. They do footnote consumer and other, footnote one. That footnote is based on how they classify things. They reclassified base and payment related revenue from consumer revenue, and they put that in other transaction revenue. Consumer revenue is if I trade crypto on a platform. Institutional revenue is when a bigger entity, like a company, trades crypto on a platform. This page talks about the trading volume for consumer and institutional. Trading volume is a total US dollar equivalent of a trade. Trading volume is directly influenced by market dynamics. To put it in simpler terms, the price of crypto assets. Also, volatility, macroeconomic conditions, and their share of the total crypto market by spot trading volume. When there's high crypto asset prices and high asset volatility, they experience higher trading volume, which I think makes sense. But consumers only have 37 billion of trading volume in the most recent quarter. Institutions, 189 billion. They just charge less fees to institutions. That's why the volume is so high, but the fees are lower. And both are up a lot, up 146% from last year, from the second quarter of 2023. Last year, 40% of their volume was Bitcoin, now it's 35%. Ethereum was 23%, now it's 15%. 10% of the volume is USDT. If you wanna learn more about USDT, it's a symbol for Tether, a cryptocurrency pegged to the US dollar. It only fluctuates in value as the US dollar fluctuates. And you could buy USDT in a lot of places, not just Coinbase, in Kraken and many other crypto exchanges. That's 60% of their volume. These three, 40% are other crypto assets. And no other crypto asset represents more than 10% of their trading volume. Here's a breakdown of their transaction revenue. 31% is Bitcoin. Even though Bitcoin represents 35% of their volume, it's only 31% of their revenue. Ethereum, more revenue than volume. Solana is 10% of their revenue. What is this 53 million of other transaction revenue? Let's look for that. We also earn other transaction revenue, which consists of sequencer fees from base users and fees charged for payment related transactions. Sequencing is the process of organizing transactions into blocks. And you would think this is done on a first come first serve basis, but that's not true. Transactions are organized into blocks based on the transaction fees and the MEV, maximum extractable value. Subscription and services revenue, 600 million. That went up like 90%. Stablecoin revenue, 240 million. And if you're not sure what that is, you can just search the term and they define it. Stablecoin is USDC. They earn a pro rata portion of income earned on USDC reserves. The more USDC they hold, the higher the fees for them. Blockchain rewards, 185 million. That's their proof of stake service. That's when they stake the crypto in their customers' wallets. It's kind of like interest on a checking account. It's the same idea. When you put money into your bank account, you earn interest on that money. So if you stake your crypto, you can earn more crypto on your crypto. Then they earn 69 million from interest and finance fee income. This company earns interest on the funds they hold in custodial accounts, the funds they hold for their customers. They also earn interest and fees from loans. They provide loans to institutional customers through prime financing. Custodial fee revenue, 35 million. They earn custodial fees based on the crypto assets they hold in their cold storage solutions. And of course, their custodial fee revenue is dependent on the fee rates they charge to their customers. And then other subscription and services revenue, 70 million. This is revenue from Coinbase One, developer product revenue. That includes revenue they receive from subscription licenses. Most of their revenue is in the US, 1.2 billion. That almost exactly doubled from last year. 
International revenue tripled 70 million to 217 million, almost exactly tripled, a little more. Maybe it grew around 205% or so. So revenue grew 100% when you compare second quarter of 23 to second quarter of 24. Let's look at their expenses. Transaction expenses, 190 million. That's 13% of their revenue, down from 15% last year. Technology, 360 million. That's down a lot. It was 45% of their revenue last year. Now it's 25%. That's what happens when you scale and grow and economies of scale set in. Your margins increase. Your expenses as a percent of your revenue decrease. They're spending 40 million more in technology and development when you compare last year to this year, but the percent has gone down dramatically. Sales and marketing is also down from 12% to 11%. GNA is down a lot, 37% to 22%. So total expenses, 1.1 billion. Last year, expenses were 110% of their revenue. This year, 76%. So operating income is positive 340 million. They had a negative last year. Net income is 36 million because they had an income tax benefit of 96 million. Last year, they paid 19 million in taxes. So they had a net loss of 100 million. Their EPS is 15 cents, earnings per share. They have 246 million shares outstanding. They added 12 million from last year. Last year they had 234 million. Let's look at their balance sheet. Total assets 287 billion. Billion with a B. Up from 207 billion. Most of their assets are the crypto assets they're holding for their customers. That same exact asset number is also a liability. So it's not their assets. They can't use that money, just like a bank. I mean, they could use it, but they have to replace it. If you put money into a bank, the bank takes that money and loans it out. But Coinbase doesn't loan out crypto. They may stake it and earn fees off of it. Here is a breakdown of the 269 billion. Half of it is Bitcoin, 51% Bitcoin, 22% Ethereum, 6% Solana, 21% all other. I wish they gave a breakdown of the all other. Their cash went up. It was 5.1 billion. Now it's 7.2 billion. They have 1 billion in deferred tax assets. This will help reduce their taxes in the future. 1 billion of goodwill. Liabilities, 279 billion. Most of that is the crypto they're safeguarding for their customers. Also, 4.2 billion in custodial accounts. You'll see that same exact number in the asset section. Assets minus liabilities equals equity, 8.4 billion of equity. They raised 4.8 billion from selling their business. They profited 3.6 billion from running their business. The first three assets in the asset section, the 7 billion, the cash, restricted cash, 34 million, and customer custodial funds, 4.2 billion. This is the cash at the end of the accounting period. So it's around 11.4 billion. That'll be the amount on the statement of cash flows. The cash at the end of the accounting period, 11.3 billion. This is the statement of cash flows. They started the accounting period with 9.6 billion of cash and they added about 1.7 billion of cash. They added it from operating cash flow, plus investing cash flow, plus financing cash flow. If you sum up those three, it's about 1.7 billion. You see cash at the end of the accounting period, 11.3 billion. If we search this number, the 11.3 billion, it's a sum of the 7.2 billion of cash on the balance sheet, the 34 million restricted cash, and the 4 billion of custodial funds. So let's go through the statement of cash flows to see how they generated 1.7 billion of cash for the first half of 2024. They generated 900 million of cash from operating their business. And the way they did that is they had 1.2 billion of net income because remember operating cash flow is net income converted to cash. So we want to convert this 1.2 billion to 900 million. And the way we do that is we add back the non-cash items on the income statement. We add back depreciation of 63 million, stock-based compensation of 440 million, deferred income taxes 83 million, and they pass through a gain on the income statement of 387 million, a gain on crypto assets held for investment. Since they pass through a gain, a non-cash gain, we minus that out on the statement of cash flows. So they minus 386 million. This is the income statement. You won't see the 386 million on the income statement. It's kind of baked into these numbers. They do show a gain of 331 million right here on crypto assets held for investment. 
Because it's in parentheses, so it's a gain. If it was not in parentheses, there's 319 million, that's a loss in expense. Let's go back to the statement of cash flows. The last step to calculate operating cash flow is the changes in network and capital, the changes in current assets and current liabilities. So if they used accounts receivables, that's a cash outflow. If they used accounts payable, it's a cash inflow. Let's look at the investing section. They had a cash outflow of 144 million. They had an $800 million cash outflow from loans, fiat loans originated. In addition to cryptocurrency, they loan out Italian cars, fiats. And then they receive $645 million of fiat cars, replacing those loans. And their financing section, they had a cash inflow of $1 billion. They issued $1.2 billion of convertible senior notes. This is debt that the debt holder can convert to equity at their option. So the cash at the beginning of the accounting period, $9.6 billion. At the end, $11.2 billion. Let's look at employee reviews on Glassdoor. The average review is 3.7, which I think is decent. I've seen much worse in other companies. The CEO has a 70% approval rating. The first review, 5 out of 5. Amazing people, hustle culture, good perks, and remote first. The cons, a little stressful during incidents as it leads to financial impact. Here is a review, 2 out of 5, from a current employee, a data scientist. The pros, the pay is hard to beat. That's a good pro. The cons, lots of politics, unfortunately, and this will stay for a while. Every company, there's lots of politics. You'll never get around that. If you want to avoid politics, go into politics. Wait, that doesn't make sense. A current employee more than one year, two out of five. While the people working there were great, this was one of the most traumatic experiences in my professional career. It's pretty harsh. And that's a pro. Let's read the cons. Very long hours and lack of organization, prioritization, and planning. Interesting problems and great people. The pros, pretty cool to be at the bleeding edge of finance. The bleeding edge. This person really has a way with words. A lot of visuals popped into my head when I read this. Love my team and comp is solid. The cons, not a huge fan of fully remote work. Here's a one out of five, smart and talented people to work with. The cons, chaotic, toxic, underpaid. Work hour changes, required to work holidays. Oh my God, it's like slavery. You gotta work holidays? Cancerous culture. The pros, high pay, remote work policy. The cons, the culture is cold. Not just cold, incredibly cold. They are ready to kick you out the door the moment they have a chance. That's not a good feeling. Well run ship. Well run ship, it's a crypto trading platform. It's not a vessel. Pros, people, industry, high bar, off sites. High bar? It sounds like Mad Men, there's a bar in every office. Cons, getting more intense to work there. Great culture, broad scope, fantastic colleagues. The pros, scope of work, enjoy a wide ranging scope due to the optimal company size. Large enough to matter, small enough for impact. Talent density, work alongside highly talented individuals passionate about their craft. Innovative field, engage with ever evolving and exciting crypto space, offering endless learning opportunities. The cons, past leadership issues, experienced periods of poor leadership, though recent changes have ushered instability. Career growth challenges, advancement can be difficult with high demands placed on employees. How dare them place demands on employees? Just let them do what they want. Advice to management, maintain rigorous standards for leadership to ensure continued stability and growth. Support employee development actively to address career advancement challenges. Very fast-paced. Fast-paced culture, you learn a lot. Cons. Minimal work-life balance makes personal life difficult. Roll coaster of a journey. Not sure what a roll coaster is. Oh, it's a coaster underneath a roll. Oh, I get it. The pros, great people and opportunity to work in an exciting industry. Good opportunity to grow and extend yourself. Cons, unstable industry, so a lot of change and fear of layoffs always looming. Three out of five, not easy, but you will learn a lot. Pros, lots of ownership and cross-functional work. Cons, lots of it. Speed values over quality. Unfortunately, with a broker or trading firm, speed is really, really important. Product does not do anything or really understand anything, but get most credit. 
What kind of sentence is this? I don't even know what they're trying to say. Are they trying to say the product doesn't do anything, like crypto is useless? Or are they saying the employees don't do anything? Advice to management, stop paying product and data the same as the builders. Oh, I see, so product is a group of people. That's probably a division, the product division. Now it makes sense, the product division doesn't do anything or understand anything, but they get the credit. Well, generally the higher up people get the credit, even if the lower people did all the work. But if something goes wrong, the higher up people should be the first in line to get in trouble. Customer service representative, former employee, eh, short and sweet. Pros, lots of benefits, great work community. Cons, poor management. CEO rather buy houses than service his employees. Service his employees? It's not a brothel. SWE intern salary. I had to Google this. That's software engineer. Pros, 50 per hour is okay. An intern at 50 per hour is okay? Sheesh, a full-time employee at 50 an hour is really good. Cons, rent cost is so high. You're getting 50 an hour. Get some roommates. Two out of five, becoming an overly political sweatshop. Well, if you're trying to lose weight, you want to be in a sweatshop so you can sweat it off. The pros, high compensation, fast paced remote. That's an interesting group of words. Fast paced remote. Cons, unhelpful people, toxic culture, volatile economic macro environment. Wow, that's a pretty big phrase there. This was a former software engineer. Ever growing expectations. How dare they have expectations that grow? Their expectations should be getting lower, not growing. Incredible company. Coinbase is the same as working with one of the FANG companies. Great employee support, conducive environment for learning and collaboration, and incredible attitude for success from coworkers. Con, sadly, like all tech companies, your job is subject to frequent market turns and mass layoffs. That is true, lots of big companies are at the mercy of mass layoffs. Mixed feelings, pros, fantastic place to work if you want to break into the crypto scene. We'll have you making a lot of industry connections and learning Web3 blockchain things that are hard to learn on your own. Cons, mission too vague, increase economic freedom. This doesn't give much direction. Lots of products compete with other products internally leading to weird corporate politics. Well, there's going to be crossover with any company. Not many companies have totally unique products. Usually there's connections between products. It kind of makes sense for a company to have similar products. Not everybody is a Walmart. Not everybody sells a million different things. Layoffs have done a number on morale. Well, I'm sure they will do a lot of morale. Only one offsite a year. In my opinion, a remote company needs an offsite a quarter to function properly. Actually, I can't stand those offsite meetings or offsite get togethers. Meeting so infrequently kills team culture. Kill is a little strong. I would say hurt or injure. Meeting so infrequently injures team culture. Kill is such a concrete term. When you kill someone, they're dead. They're not coming back. When you injure them, they can recover. Bad work-life balance. Worth it if you're passionate about crypto and Web3. Advice to management. Up offsite budget and frequency. This person really likes the offsites. Let's read some comments on Yahoo Finance. Coinbase's handling of the recent outages exemplifies the company's leadership in the crypto and blockchain technology market. And here's a reply to that comment. Your write-up gives me goosebumps and I feel fuzzy all over again about coin. It sounds a little sarcastic, but it's kind of funny. We could see 100 plus tomorrow if they provide a positive outlook. With Bitcoin currently trading above 35K, that might be the case. This blue line is the price of Coinbase since they started trading. The purple line is the price of Bitcoin. There's no mystery into how the stock price moves. If the price of Bitcoin goes up, so does Coinbase and vice versa. Although Bitcoin is up 6% since this company IPO'd, while this stock is down 31%. So Bitcoin is a much better investment. That's why we're saying the fundamentals don't really matter for this company. It's the price of crypto, mainly Bitcoin. Ethereum is a dark blue line. That's down 9% since Coinbase IPO'd. So Bitcoin is doing the best. Coinbase is doing the worst. Actually, we have a new winner. Dogecoin is down 74% since Coinbase IPO'd. So the biggest loser is Dogecoin. Coin is doing about 1 billion in revenue in 4Q23. That gives you 34 billion market cap over 4 billion revenue equals 8.5 price to sales ratio. Tell us more, professor.
Crushed earnings, excellent forward-looking estimates, down in post. Why? The big money is manipulating so they can purchase shares below $10. Thank you. Sandy was thinking the same. Just waiting for the conference call. I suspect we will see 325 in a few weeks. Thumbs up. So coin is up today with Bitcoin down. So what? Coin was down yesterday with Bitcoin up. So what? Its stock price is based on earnings, not Bitcoin. Well, it is based on Bitcoin, not earnings. Coin is a stock, not a Bitcoin ETF. Anyone remember what happened last time Coin had a 30% pullback in December? It rallied from 125 to 280 in two months. When it does it again, and it probably will, Coin will be around 450. It could happen in two months, like last time, or maybe by end of the year. No one can know, especially the analysts wannabes here. You'll worry too much. They will beat Q3 by all aspects with a stellar performance. The 2024 forecast will be better with ETFs holding income. They are the custodians of every ETFs and possible expansion. Bitcoin run global expansion, halving and rest of the crypto run benefits them. The stock will be up 20 to 30 by tomorrow and then it will take a bull run through April. A nice article of the prospects of coin written by the Motley Crue analyst team. The band Motley Crue is now analyzing stocks. Tommy Lee is an analyst. It points out several positive moves by CEO Armstrong and his team over the past several years. With the average investor now able to participate in the investment into the crypto markets via ETFs, the coin platform will see massive inflows from these institutions. My guess is this company is going to see big gains and more expansion world war. My take, when I was a kid, I didn't have money, but I did have marbles and our gang traded marbles. Our gang? Crypto is the same as trading marbles. For us, marbles were of value and I could trade them for a candy bar. SEC is trying to regulate marble trading and they are having trouble as expected. Great points and way of looking at crypto versus fiat currency. Are these marbles embedded with technology to make them inherently better transactional tools and stores of value? That the SEC is having trouble regulating crypto since the nature of blockchain is to have an open source ledger where transactional data should be widely accessible. Nailing down those wallets will be an interesting debacle between the government and people. I still trade marbles, the only thing I'm good at it. <laughs> Having event will continue to create upward pressure on BYC. BYC, base year compensation? Oh, I know what it means. Having event will continue to create upward pressure on, bitch, you crazy. Oh, I know what it means now. Having event will continue to create upward pressure on Boston Yacht Club. 50 to 55K this week. Coinbase 150 to 155 before ER. Expecting a small bear, but significant 190 to 200 Friday. SEC lawsuit partially dismissed, 300 plus in 2024. By the end of the week, coin will be 150 to 155. Still overpriced. <laughs> Vegan mafia boss. I've seen a lot of complaints on this board this morning about Bitcoin rising on low volume. My leading theory is because people who believe in Bitcoin aren't selling and most of the weak hands have already jumped ship. Be careful if you jump ship, you gotta know how to swim. Coins will either fade away or revolutionize the world. This is the most fun ride I have ever had for a long time. For this 80 year old, it's rejuvenating. I love coin. That seems like a pretty wholesome comment. When I first got into crypto in 2022, Bitcoin was fluctuating between 16 and 21,000. I did not take it seriously at the time. Investing only a small amount before giving up because I didn't have the right strategy. But now with Bitcoin at 51,000, I'm asking if anyone has the right method to profit from the current market. Sounds like a bot wrote this. It is truly astounding to witness Bitcoin reach 51K. In the next six months, 76K. No dispute, the market is profitable to those that grab it, basics. I like the addition of the word basics. How can a newbies get in the track and start benefiting from it too? Seeking advice from a financial advisor slash edge investors can really help. Get to the point already. You are on point. Do you have any preferred investors with a strong edge? I'm looking for individuals who are honest and disciplined. Do you have one you can recommend? I want to find out who the scammer is so I can invest with them. I love that you added the importance of having a mentor. That's definitely a key factor in achieving success. Honestly, Kathy is a shoulder I rest on. She's genuine and transparent. Absolutely, we value trust above all else. 
We're committed to delivering results and maintaining transparency every step of the way. And Kathy is disciplined one can entrust. And here's the number for Kathy, the WhatsApp number. Yeah, my mentor. For more, DM her on Facebook, Kathy Baldwin. She's a Baldwin.